feel like I stepped into the pages of uh, The Secret Life of Alejandro Maita, if anyone's read that book, uh, by Mario Vargas Llosa. Uh, and I think that um, those of us who care about the issues that the Green Party stands for uh, have to begin to ask some really tough questions about ourselves. Um, uh, because, uh, frankly, uh, as this last election illustrated, uh, we're not having any traction with the American public. Uh, and I think the question has to be asked, why? Uh, we're not going to build a movement if we're not relentlessly and ruthlessly self-critical. Uh, we'll go nowhere. Uh, and uh, I'll lay out some of my own ideas uh, as to why I think we have failed. Uh, and I think we have failed at a moment of crisis when these ideas should resonate uh, as they did, uh, we saw with Zuccotti Park, uh, out through the mainstream. Uh, and I think first and foremost, uh, the failure of the Green Party is that it continues to play by their rules. Uh, it continues to uh, put far too much energy into electoral politics. Uh, that doesn't mean that the Green Party shouldn't field candidates, but that should be a very tangential part of what this party is about. Um, the other problem is that I think that it retreats uh, far too often into the abstract. Uh, we, at this point, don't need another critique of the corporate state. Uh, I think all of us in this room, indeed beyond this room, uh, have a very clear understanding that we have undergone a corporate coup d'etat in slow motion, and it's over, they've won. Uh, I don't think that has even become a radical idea uh, within uh, most of American society. Um, large numbers uh, within this country recognize that it is impossible to vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs, ExxonMobil, Citibank, Bank of America, General Electric, you've got the list. Uh, and the question is, how do we respond? Uh, what is the most effective way to begin to mobilize against these entities that uh, quite literally are going to destroy the ecosystem on which the human species depends for life? And we have very, very little time left, as anyone who has read climate science reports including the newest report uh, from the World Bank, of all places, uh, understands. Uh, these uh, unfettered, unregulated capitalism, as Karl Marx understood, is a revolutionary force. It commodifies everything. Uh, human beings become commodities. The natural world becomes a commodity that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And that's why when we see the melting of the summer Arctic sea ice, uh, Shell Oil looks at it as a business opportunity. It's the death throes of the planet. Um, and uh, to continue to essentially funnel energy into a dead political system, which is what we have, the political theater itself, uh, I think uh, essentially is going to suck out whatever life force we may be able to impart. Uh, the fact is the only way that we are going to build any kind of effective resistance uh, to these corporate forces is to rebuild the movements uh, that prove to be all of the uh, true correctives to American democracy. Howard Zinn uh, pointed this out in uh, The People's History of the United States, uh, as did uh, Baird in his study of constitutional conventions. Uh, this uh, country was never set up to be direct, uh, to foster direct democracy or popular rule. Uh, it was created by a white, oligarchic, largely slave-holding elite uh, that made sure that its positions of economic and political privilege would be retained, uh, so that all of the openings in American democracy were fought for and often paid for with the blood of abolitionists, suffragists, uh, working men and women in unions, uh, civil rights workers, and let's not forget the Communist Party. That has been utterly erased from American history. But the Communist Party, certainly in the 1920s and 30s, especially if you were black, because uh, uh, there was uh, segregation, uh, whether it was in the Chautauqua movement and the social gospel, whether it was in the Pullman uh, railroad strike, uh, and whether it was, although Debs was, was wary of this, whether it was in the socialist movement itself. Uh, and I think that, that we have to turn away from the enticement of running candidates here, running candidates there, having seminars on this topic or that topic. Uh, I just think it's going to go nowhere. 
Um, I think we have to begin to turn and do a complete bout, about face and focus solely on what is absolutely concrete. For example, um, if I was running the Green Party, and uh, I have no intention of ever running any party, uh, I would put all of my energy into building a food bus uh, so that when there were acts of civil disobedience, whether that is against the Keystone Pipeline, whether that is students who finally decide that they have had enough of the debt peonage, uh, that of course is part a long history, uh, or has a long history in this country of being a very effective form of political control, as any African American can tell you. Uh, you, you, you arrive um, and essentially are handing out, uh, as we did in Zuccotti Park, bagels with peanut butter on them and coffee. Uh, I think that that is the only way that we are going to build a movement, and that is to, to those of us who care about challenging this system, begin to create logistics by which resistance is possible. And that, of course, is the problem. Uh, the, uh, I covered the uh, Civil War in El Salvador for five years uh, and, and became very uh, familiar with the, the a very effective tactics of counterinsurgency, uh, which broke the FMLN, rebel movement, in El Salvador, which was the most sophisticated rebel force in Latin America, far outstripping anything that took place in Nicaragua under Somoza or under Bautista in Cuba. When I first got to El Salvador in uh, 83, I was caught up in firefights that were lasting uh, numerous hours between upwards of eight and 900 armed rebels and a battalion. Uh, once Reagan in the, in the uh, early part of 1984 sent down a fleet of 70 Huey helicopters, it essentially made that capacity to build uh, large units uh, and which you need logistical bases from impossible. Uh, and when Zuccotti Park was wiped out, uh, I knew precisely what the state was doing. And let's be clear who was doing it. His name is Barack Obama. It was a coordinated effort out of Washington to erase the encampments. And that was denying the opposition, the first effective opposition against corporate power, a logistical base with which they could work from. And if you talk to those, and I think one of the most important acts of civil disobedience underway is the attempt to block uh, the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline. Let's not delude ourselves. Barack Obama has every intention of building the northern leg. Uh, and if you talk to people, activists down there, what, what is it that they lack? They lack logistical support. And I think for uh, radicals, for the Green Party, uh, for those of us who care apart about getting uh, this, this message, this alternative message to corporate capitalism across, um, it's time, as we say in Arabic, to end what they call the kalam fadi, which is the empty talk. Um, long ago, as a writer, I decided that I wasn't going to ever write an article that told people what to do. You should go out and do this. You should go out and do that. I decided I'm just going to do it. And if I'm all alone, that's fine. Um, but I'm not going to wait, and I'm not going to preach. Um, and if somebody wants to walk with me, they can walk with me. Uh, and that, of course, ended my job at the New York Times by denouncing the Iraq War. Uh, that led me to uh, sue President Barack Obama uh, over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which we won in federal court in the Southern District Court of New York. We are now waiting for the appellate court. I just resigned from Penn. Uh, and I'm not going to speak at the festival in May. I was an invited speaker because uh, of the appointment of uh, Susan Nozel, a former State Department official, uh, a cheerleader for the war in Iraq, uh, you know, who, who uh, pretty much destroyed Amnesty International. I mean, she was overseeing Amnesty International when it mounted uh, a public relations campaign where they were putting up billboards in bus stations uh, calling on NATO to continue the job in Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that, that the failure on the part of the left in this country um, is that, uh, and I'm talking about the established left, not the Occupy movement, they did what we should do, um, is that we haven't acted. We don't act. Um, you know, we, we're all, we're all uh, very good about making uh, uh, quite uh, sophisticated moral pronouncements about the system uh, or uh, condemning those who don't follow us. 
Uh, and I really think that um, that kind of, that essentially drives the movement inward rather than outward. Uh, I have watched powerful resistance movements, including Hamas and Gaza, build. I covered, when I first went to Gaza, Hamas didn't exist. I, I covered that whole trajectory of the rise of Hamas in Gaza. And how did they begin? They went into the refugee camps like Hani Yunus or Jabalia with a truck filled with bags of rice. They created uh, uh, logistical centers by which children could be educated. They, they, they built medical clinics. And, and the beauty of that is that when you actually serve the logistical needs of the oppressed, you hear what the oppressed need. And if we can't hear what the oppressed need, uh, and, and let's not be dismissive of the most basic things they need, which is something to eat, a place to live, rather than sleeping in their car. Um, it, it's easy to, uh, you know, uh, condemn, for instance, people who give micro loans as 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 holding up the system. And I think that this uh, is uh, a failure on the part of those of us who don't live in that kind of distress and don't understand now. And my book, with it, which I did with Joe Sacco, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt is written out of the poorest pockets of the United States, literally, including Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in the United States, and not surprisingly the most dangerous, and just had its police union broken. Uh, and, and that kind of severance between ideologues of the left and the underclass has atrophied the left, has destroyed us. It's been a long process. When we were in southern West Virginia uh, with Joe Sacco, who illustrated the book, uh, who was the hero in the old coal fields? Michelle Bachman, Sarah Palin. Who was the hero in the coal fields in 1914? It was Mother Jones and Big Bill Haywood and John Lewis. And that, that cutting off of radical movements, cutting off the roots of radical movements from the underclass uh, has dissipated. Uh, it, it, was, it was dissipated the left in this country. Um, largely left it speaking to itself in a kind of echo chamber. And I think that the uh, example for me, I, I was a kid in the 60s, although my father was involved in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement, is that severance between labor and the new left. The new left in the 60s, uh, and I'm talking about the anti-war left, uh, was largely middle class, largely white, and labor was captivated by figures like George Meany and Lane Kirkland, who were not only passing resolutions in the AFL-CIO supporting Nixon's war in Indochina, but denouncing the protesters in the street. And, I, and, I, and, and, that, and there are writers who have dealt with this issue, Dwight MacDonald being one, uh, you know, the breaking of movements, and I spend a lot of time in my book, Death of the Liberal Class, talking about how radical movements were destroyed and severed from the left. Um, and so at this moment of crisis, when uh, we are teetering once again on the brink of financial collapse, even writers like Gretchen Morgison in the business section of the New York Times are raising this as a specter, uh, when climate change, uh, which as Joseph Stiglitz correctly points out, is going to have tremendous economic impacts, wait till uh, the next hurricane season, wait till it's a category two instead of a category one, wait till it's $140 billion worth of damage instead of 70, um, begins to uh, 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 tear the country apart, literally. Um, I think we're woefully unprepared, both in terms of what we need to do to respond and how we are thinking about the crisis. Uh, and the state is not unprepared. Um, the state knows very well what's coming. It has run plenty of scenarios on climate change and everything else uh, through the NSC. And that is why they are, as fast as they can, stripping away our most basic civil liberties. Um, that is how we get uh, the misinterpretation of the 2001 authorization to use Military Force Act as uh, permitting the executive branch to order the assassination of American citizens. That is how we get the FISA Amendment Act, which retroactively made legal what under our Constitution has traditionally been illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of tens of millions of us. And of course, our information is now stored in perpetuity out in a supercomputer in Utah. And why was it retroactive? Because after Verizon 
and AT&T and other telecommunications companies gave our personal information to the government, there were suits in the lower courts uh, because it's a clear violation of Constitution, our right to privacy. And they knew they'd lose. And so they walked in there with their suitcases full of cash, one of which they handed to our current president, who was a senator at the time, uh, to make sure that they had retroactive immunity for what they had done. That is how we get the Espionage Act, used six times by the Obama administration to shut down whistleblowers, uh, including Kiriakou, who just started a 30-month prison term in a prison in Pennsylvania. I was an investigative journalist for the New York Times, and uh, all my former colleagues tell me they can get nothing anymore from the government, even on background. People are terrified of speaking because of the, th the real threat of a jail term. Anything that counters the official narrative. That is why they are persecuting Bradley Manning. That's part of the reason that I left, I resigned from Penn, because uh, Penn ignores our most important dissidents, including Manning, uh, to sort of shove it in the face of China and everywhere else. I mean, the hypocrisy is rather staggering. Um, that is, of course, while they are pushing through Section 1021 of the NDAA. Section 1021 of the NDAA uh, says that uh, the government, the military, is permitted to seize U.S. citizens who, quote unquote, substantially support, that's not a legal term, that's not materialist support, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or something called associated forces. Again, a nebulous term, strip them of due process and hold them indefinitely in military facilities. That law was passed for the Occupy movement. Uh, and when Judge Forrest, Catherine Forrest, last September in the Southern District Court of New York ruled in our favor and declared the law unconstitutional, in her 112-page opinion, which is worth reading, uh, she said that this law, in essence, opens up the possibility for the government to indefinitely detain an entire class of people based on what they believe. And she cited the example of the 110,000 Japanese Americans who were detained in World War II as an illustration of what this law allows. Now, you know, the Obama administration when we won, the day we won, sent not only the government, the, the attorneys, uh, the federal attorneys into the office, but they suddenly appeared with Pentagon attorneys. And in the name of national security, they asked Judge Forrest to uh, immediately pass a temporary injunction, mean, meaning put the law back into effect until the appellate court hears the case. She refused. They then went to the appellate court and demanded, this was a Friday afternoon, demanded an emergency hearing at 9 a.m. on Monday morning at the Second Circuit, which they got. Again, asking the appellate court to put the law back into effect, lift the injunction until the appellate court, which is now deliberating on the case, issues its ruling. Now, we knew that the Obama administration would appeal, but we didn't know they would act that aggressively. And that can only mean one thing and that is that they are already using the law, probably against dual uh, Pakistani US nationals in places like Bagram. And um, the, I just want to make sure my son, where's my son? Oh, okay. And the, uh, 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 the, the reason that they had to issue the injunction is because if they are in fact holding US citizens, as I believe they are in some of our black sites, and that injunction was allowed to stand, then they would be held in contempt of court. That's what we're up against. Um, I think oftentimes within the Occupy movement, uh, and I think the Occupy movement t scared the hell out of the state, um, uh, there's a failure to understand the uh, resources available to the state to destroy movements. You can go back and look at the history of COINTELPRO, uh, but we've evolved as a security and surveillance state far beyond that. I covered the fall of East Germany, the Stasi state, uh, which was the most sophisticated security and surveillance state until the creation of our own security and surveillance state. And um, they, they know very well what they have to do. They, they have to decapitate the movement by denying it a logistical base. They have to hound and harass those who, and they do that through infiltration, those within the movement who they find effective that's how we have one of a very important Zuccotti activist uh, was standing in Zuccotti Park with a pair of scissors in his hand and uh, the police suddenly arrested him and charged him with assault 
with a deadly weapon against a police officer, which is a seven-year jail time. It's completely fictitious, but they knew who he was, and they knew who they wanted to get. So when he's hauled up for, before court, and the lawyer asks if they can plea out, the government attorney or the prosecutor says no, because he is on the homeland terrorism list. And if we begin to build, as the Occupy movement did, effective forms of resistance, we can expect tremendous blowback. Uh, because internally, the corporate state is utterly corrupt and rotten. And the reason that they passed the NDAA is, I believe, it's speculation, is because they know that eventually there will be unrest and they don't trust the police to protect them. And they're right. Uh, police, for whatever egregious acts they carried out in the streets of Oakland or New York or anywhere else during the Occupy encampments, are working class. They have sisters-in-laws who have lost their jobs as school teachers. They have family members who also are living on unemployment if they're lucky enough to still get unemployment. Um, they're working in New York City. Uh, for $37 an hour at rent -a cops at places like Goldman Sachs, watching these guys in $8,000 suits walk by them like their furniture. You saw it in Zuccotti. The demeanor changed markedly every time the white shirts appeared and every time the white shirts disappeared. And, uh, and so my energy uh, was put uh, uh, into the Occupy movement rather than the Green Party uh, because it was a movement. And I think if the Green Party has any hope of becoming a credible player, um, it, it better do a complete about face and begin to focus on the kinds of logistics that make resistance possible. Long discussions about the evils of corporate capitalism or showing another film at a college campus, I think, is an utter and complete waste of time. Um, we don't have time for it. And I think that it's clear from the Occupy movement that there are millions of Americans who understand the precarious situation all of us are living in and are ready to respond. And you saw that with the upsurge of popular support for the Occupy movement, which caught the Occupy movement completely off guard. And the fact is that the Occupy movement, when you think about it, was a mainstream movement. It articulated, we, and we even know that from the polls, it articulated the concerns of the mainstream. Protecting education, creating a credible jobs program, especially targeted at people under the age of 25, forgiving student debt, taking health care out of the hands of corporations, and recognizing that health care is a human right, building a system of universal health care. Um, these were uh, issues uh, that were not marginal issues, not confined to a particular segment of the society, but resonated out across the landscape. And of course, the force that was most frightened of the Occupy movement was the Democratic Party, because the Occupy movement utterly exposed the bankruptcy of the Democratic Party. So, and I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, by the way, I apologize for being late. My wife was sick, and so the house, of course, fell into utter chaos. And at the moment that I was supposed to be here, I was, in fact, with my children in the backyard being the big bad wolf, chasing them around the swing set. Um, and, and so my day went haywire. But I'm glad I made it, and I'm glad Conrad's over there watching Olivia on a computer. Um, but I think that that, that for me, is, uh, you know, that. It, it, will, it, it, it would dramatically change the relationship that I think traditional Green Party activists often have had. Um, but I think we've really almost got to begin from ground zero. Uh, I, I can, you know, there would, would have been in Zuccotti or in any of these encampments or now currently in the XL, and of course there's no shortage of uh, civil actions of civil disobedience even within this radius. Um, the power, the collective power of having, I mean, I throw this out as an example, I'm not telling you all to go out and buy a bus, but the collective power of having a food bus just show up 
and offer that kind of physical support would very rapidly begin to translate into uh, the dissemination of the thoughts and ideas that we care about. And I think that uh, for many of us who do care about these issues, we've gone about it completely backwards. We've essentially tried to replicate uh, a, a, a system of power uh, that is used by corporate parties, but which is utterly um, unsuitable for those of us who are trying to build movements. Um, we don't have the resources. We will never have that voice. Um, I, I don't think we have any more time for seminars. I can't, you know, I engage in acts of civil disobedience. Um, I, I don't like going to jail. Going to jail is more time than I really want to donate to my government. Um, and yet, uh, I don't think that we have any option left. And I think that, um, again, if we want to have credibility for what we believe and what we care about, it is going to require us uh, to move out of rooms like these uh, and stand on fences in front of the White House in Lafayette Park and be hauled away by the cops. That's it. That's it. Um, the, the, you know, the time for talking is over. Um, we don't have any more time for talking. Um, now it's about action. And so resistance parties like this one have a, dis a historic decision to make. They can either act or they can atrophy into utter irrelevance. Thank you. Um, what are your feelings on the Idle No More Canadian? Uh, Idle No More is a perfect, perfect example, example of what I'm talking about. Perfect. And I think, I think I think part of the problem, I have very limited exposure to the Green Party, but I'll just, from my limited exposure, is there's too many chiefs. Everybody wants to be a chief. And I think, again, what I liked about the Occupy movement is that it detested that hierarchical form of power, which is sucks the lifeblood out of organizations. Now, I'm sure there's some people here who are in the Occupy movement. A seven-hour General Assembly drove me nuts. Um, and yet, when the Occupy movement made a decision, it abided by that decision. And I think that um, hierarchy, which again is emblematic within the Green Party, is, uh, it, it is it's a failure, it, it, is, it is a grafting of traditional structures of power onto a party for which it is incredibly not unfit. And I don't know more is great. I mean, I love the story about the, there was a strike, I think it was in San Francisco, I can't remember, at the turn of the century. And so the Wobblies sent like a boatload of workers, supporters, and, uh, and they were met you know, at the docks by the city's finest who were beating the crap out of them, screaming, where are your leaders, where are your leaders? And they go, we're all leaders. And, and I, you know, because I spoke so much about the Occupy movement, I always spoke about them in the third person. They, they. I mean, you know, I had many members of the Direct Action Committee camped out in my house in Princeton, but I did not want to be a spokesperson for them. I also was very critical of the Black Bloc, which was quite a contentious issue within Occupy. Uh, and I, I, you know, and, and there were even members of Occupy who were not members of the Black Bloc that felt that I had betrayed them. And I said, look, the moment I, as an intellectual or writer, need to walk through that park and get your adulation, I'm finished. You know, my role is to, as in, an, in the most unvarnished way I can, speak the truth, even when that truth is unpopular. Um, that's my role. That's why I don't want to run for office. That's why I don't want to head movements. Um, I, I have a kind of constitutional allergy to long meetings that comes with growing up in the church. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I don't know more is uh, the, the student movement in Quebec is another one. But I think that if the Green Party is serious about uh, making itself viable, um, it has to jettison the hierarchy. It has to stop hanging around, um, you know, talking about 
um, the nature of corporate capitalism, or I, I'm not condemning people in this room because I don't know you, but I'm just giving you a general impression. Um, and it, it's got to really, every meeting has to be something concrete. And, and in fact, having covered movements all over the world, everything you care about will come out of focusing on the concrete. In fact, and let's go back to the food truck, just because I think it actually is a good idea. All of the effort it would take to creating a food truck and stocking it and getting whatever licenses Chris Christie makes you get before he confiscates your food truck um, <laughs> would itself create the kind of nucleus that you care about and would create the kind of outreach that you need. I mean, imagine what it would mean. Let's take the XL. I mean, those mostly kids up in those trees are, uh, they don't have any food. I mean, they're living on basically peanut butter and stale bagels from the same people. That's it. Imagine what it would mean just to have, a, I know the XL is a little far from New Jersey, but the, you know, that, a truck show up and hand them out some hot coffee. Don't underestimate the power of that. Not just as a tool to create logistical support, but to begin to build the kind of dialogue and alliances, and I'm talking about political, ideological alliances um, that will uh, begin to challenge corporate power. The, um, the Black Panthers in the 60s created the food truck and logistics, and they were decimated. So um, what is to prevent the current emphasis on food trucks and uh, logistics for the uh, government to decimate anybody well, who participates in that, just as they did the Black Panthers. Right. Now, this is nothing. Okay. Let's, let's talk about the Black. Let's talk about, about the Black Panthers, Panthers yeah, because that's a good Panthers. example. The Panthers were a bifurcated organization. At the top, you had uh, Huey Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, and the other gangsters. Um, at the bottom, and I, and this is something I've had with long discussions with Mumia Abu Jamal, <laughs> who I'm about to go see again. Um, you had another Panther movement. That was the movement that was running the breakfast program, living in group houses, uh, had no money, out on the street 12 hours a day trying to sell the Black Panther Party. So the problem with the Panthers was, again, the hierarchical nature of power. And Mumia's experience in the Panthers was very different. I mean, Mumia, you know, at the end, Newton moved everybody to Oakland. It, I mean, he just went insane. So all the Panthers, and that's what just decimated the Panther movement in New York, created the Black Liberation Army, et cetera. So Mumia actually went to Oakland, lives in a group house. He never saw Huey New. He never saw Brower. He never saw any of these people. And uh, you're right, the Panthers were decimated, and the state knew who to target, which is why they killed Fred Hampton, because he was the best thing the Panthers had. Um, and I can tell you that if the state feels threatened, and right now they don't feel, the Occupy movement scared them. I wouldn't say they felt threatened, but it did scare them. But if they feel threatened, they will employ the violence of the state to take us down. I mean, that's just traditional. And part of the reason why I keep pushing nonviolence is because as a foreign correspondent, I know what special forces do. I've seen them at work. They're death squads. We have 60,000 members of the Special Forces alone. That's not a game we're going to win. Um, so I mean, yeah, of course, if we become effective, um, the state, as they already are, are going to attempt to decapitate the movement internally by removing those people who are effective voices. And every time I go in and out of the country, the state sends me a little message. So I just came back from Canada. I land, Homeland Security, guy on the computer, and whatever it is on my computer, he knows he can treat me like shit. And the whole demeanor changes to being derisive. And he says, why are you coming back from Calgary? You usually come back from Montreal. I said, well, no, I don't. I usually come back from Toronto. He said, don't talk to me. I have the record in front of me. I said, well, the record's wrong. I'm allowed through. But it's a kind of reminder, although not always. I mean, I came back from Italy and I was held for an hour at Newark for no reason, just held until somebody came over and said to the guy behind the screen, tell him he's on a watch, he can go. 
Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, if, if, if they feel threatened, they're going to start playing dirty. That's what they do. I think that's really important, but I, I am a member of a local Green Party in New Jersey, the Essex Passaic Green Party, and the whole idea of for, that you, that you who, who forums, I'd like to challenge a little bit here, because, for example, fracking is awful, it's killing people across the country, making them sick, and there are 13 pipelines coming into the state which people don't know about. They don't even know what fracking is, and our, and our waste, waste as you know, and everyone knows, is being processed here in New Jersey. So we feel like we want to have a forum on fracking that ends up telling people to, right. to challenge the but, system but and commit to this. But this totally fits with, with what I'm saying. saying. Fracking is a concrete issue. The Keystone Pipeline is a concrete issue. These are concrete issues. So you organize around the concrete. Yes, you should organize around fracking, but I would say that if you want credibility, as an alternative voice, you better be prepared to go up and get arrested around fracking. Well, we are. Then, then you're doing exactly what I'm saying I, I believe we should be doing. Then we believe in working with other groups. We are working with other groups in New Jersey. We plan to go door to door with other organizations in Roseland where they're going to build a horrible compressor station. Just right. But <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what I'm saying, that it's, that it's not going around. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, every organizational effort should be built around action that is focused on something concrete. Another meeting about, uh, you know, uh, here's our position and why can't you understand how enlightened we are is a killer. So I, I think what you're doing is exactly what I'm advocating. Just keep them short, because i got to go. Um, yeah. There's an uh, important element that um, you may have your reasons for not mentioning it, but um, uh, Mike's mention of the Panthers, um, the, the trials proved that they were not guilty of anything, that the in infiltration Yeah, uh, no, I, I know that. I know but that. The point I'm, I'm but ask the question, because... Just keep it, keep it, keep it as, as a question, because I can't stay too long. Okay. Go ahead. I mean, ask the question. <laughs> I, mean, we can, we can, I, I think the panels are interesting, but I mean, the, it's a long discussion. The infiltration of the FBI uh, was one of the major forces that destroyed the planet. Of course. That's what I'm uh, saying. And, 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 uh, how do you deal with that? You deal with it through transparency. I mean, the, the, the only weapon we have is nonviolence and transparency. Now, the, 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 uh, the, the problem with the Panthers is that um, once you employ violence, and we see it with Muslims in this country since 9-11, 90-something plus percent, probably 99 percent, of all Muslims domestic, in, arrested in domestic terrorism plots were totally set up by the FBI. These black bloc anarchists in Cleveland, the five kids, totally set up by the FBI. We can't win at that game. You have to go back and read Havel's 1978 essay, The Power of the Powerless. I'm not naive enough to tell you we're going to win, by the way. But I'm telling you that it's the only chance we have. And, um, you know, in Zuccotti, we knew there were cops all over the fucking place in, in plain clothes. They'd show up, you know, they lift weights, they wear a baseball hat, they're about 30, they haven't shaved, tell you they went to Reed College, but they forgot their ID. And all they want to know is where the leaders are. So who do you think the leaders are? I mean, you know, after about five minutes of... They went over to the medical tent and asked some woman, so uh, who do you think the leaders are here? She said, well, I am. He said, oh, really? He said, oh, well, what are you in charge of? She goes, everything. And he goes, oh, well, what's your title? And she goes, God. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. I mean, they were, of course we're infiltrated. I mean, of course we are. And the... And the you know, I, 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 I know Homeland Security is reading my emails, and I'm about to go interview Julian Assange, so I'm sure they're all having a fit. Um, but I don't say anything in private, I don't say in public. It's an utter waste of their time. It's an utter waste of taxpayer dollars.
But what happens when you build these internal security apparatuses is that they need to justify their own existence. So they descend into the absurd. Um, you saw it in East Germany. You'd have the Stasi infiltrating stamp collection clubs. That's what you get to. Because they need, they, you know, they need to perpetuate themselves. Keep it a question, because like I'm out of here in about. Just keep it a question. Um, okay. But, um, What's the question? In the interest of college and debt, uh, where, how do we educate workers that uh, raising the minimum wage is actually good for corporate America and it actually creates jobs and it frees people from both college debt, and All right. debt? You're asking about the minimum wage. Um, raising the minimum wage is a good idea for this reason. The most effective form of political control that is now visited on the poor and the working class is debt. Um, and as anyone who has read Barbara Ehrenreich's great work, nickel and dime, being poor in this country is one long emergency. And uh, the fact that people are so crippled by debt and because they can't get a job, I mean you work, the average worker at Walmart works 28 hours a week and they're still below the poverty line. So the first thing the Walton family does, who are making $11,000 an hour, is they hand these employees applications for food stamps because they qualify. So we're, of course, we're subsidizing the Walton fortune. And building a movement around the raising of the minimum wage is a good idea uh, because it, it, is, it, 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 one, gives you an achievable victory. It crosses political lines. I mean, you go to Walmart, it doesn't matter whether they're all you know, charter members of gun owners of America, and you tell them you want to raise the minimum wage, especially if it's significant, um, that has the kind of issue. Again, it goes back to the concrete. If we're not dealing in the concrete, and the Green Party, I think, has spent a lot of time not dealing in the concrete, you're wasting your time, everyone's time. So uh, I'm for anything that fucks the system up. And raising the minimum wage fucks them up, great. Um, you know, any way we can go, anything we can do, uh, you know, uh, chaining yourself to bulldozers in upstate New York or Pennsylvania that are destroying the water table and fracking, that's anything you can do. What does a concrete action against debt and wage issues look like? Well, in terms of wage issues, it's, it's, it's classic. classic. which are strikes, uh, obviously. Strikes, uh, there was that effort against Walmart. Um, Walmart won, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, doesn't mean we shouldn't try again. Uh, you have fast food workers in New York City who just walked out of their jobs. Uh, and boy, you know, when something like that happens, that's where you should be. You should drop everything and be there. And don't start preaching at these people, because the fact is they probably know a lot more than you do. I mean, this is the problem of the left in this country. And I spent 20 years of my life in the developing world. And, and what it did is it taught me to listen. Shattered a lot of my assumptions. I graduated from seminary. i just give you one small example. I graduated from seminary. My father was a minister. And I was in a refugee camp for Salvador, victims of the war in El Salvador, in Honduras, on the, on the day of the innocents, when Herod comes in and kills all the babies, and the angels come, and Jesus flies to Egypt. And they were decorating the whole camp. These are illiterate campesinos. And I said, well, why is, the, why is the Day of the Innocents such an important holiday? And this campesino looks at me and goes, because on that day, Jesus became a refugee. Now, I could recite that passage from Luke by memory, and yet I didn't understand it. Because I had never read it through the eyes of a refugee. And part of what I do to keep myself angry is I don't sever my relationship with people who suffer. It's why I teach in a prison. Because once you sever that relationship with the oppressed, once oppression becomes an abstraction, you begin to speak nonsense and you become prey to despair. When you walk out of that prison, and I teach in Wagner, and I'm about to teach up in Rahway, when you walk out of that prison and you see what we've done to these young lives, and you're not angry, something's wrong with you. Um, and I think that uh, 
that disconnect between the oppressed, that inability on the part of the American left to build real relationships with people who suffer, has denied them any real credibility and has denied them the possibility of a corrective, more than one corrective, many correctives that might make it possible for them to begin to respond in, in a, an effective way to systems of oppression. All right, let's keep it a question. Let's just do questions. Gentlemen, how do you handle with companies that force you to sign a contract that virtually makes you an at-will employee? And Sony has done that to a lot of their companies. How do you handle companies that do what? what? You have to sign a contract, an employment contract. Yeah. yeah. But in the bottom line of that contract, it virtually makes you an at-will employee, giving up just cause. Well. I signed a contract with a Fortune 500 company, called the New York Times, and told them to go fuck themselves. So, I mean, you, there are moments when you have to defy your institution if you're, if you're going to stand for anything. I mean, anybody who believes that you can live the moral life and not clash with whatever institution you are working for, including the church, is naive. The local food, grow your own food. Yeah. Well, you just nailed. I mean, those are again concrete. Local uh, food movements, alternative currency, anything that can begin to sever ourselves from corporate dominance. I mean, that's what local currencies do. I mean, you know, in this whole banking crisis, and uh, part of my frustration with the Greens is that I remain true to Nader in 2008. I wrote several of Nader's um, policy speeches for him. Uh, but what, that whole, in 2008, Ralph Nader said, why are we giving all, why are we giving $100 billion to Citibank? Why don't we take, make 10 regional banks, like in North Dakota, state banks, why don't we give each bank $10 billion? And then why don't we tell them they can leverage it 10 to 1 if they re renegotiate these mortgages in communities where people are losing. Now that makes sense. So any kind of a response that is concrete, you know, and, and I think that there, you know, part of my frustration with the American left is we don't, we don't do much. We talk a lot, but we don't really do much. And I think that in order to regain that kind of credibility, we are going to have to regain that kind of militancy that made figures like Mother Jones, Eugene V. Debs, who goes off to prison, and when he's hauled in the prison, all the prisoners are leaning out their windows cheering for him. That kind of militancy that is based around the concrete, and if you, you know, I come out of the church, we call it a kind of witness, that ability to walk with those who suffer and endure with those who suffer what they endure. To voluntarily accept that kind of oppression is far more effective than trying to tell people how ignorant they are and how they don't understand systems of power. Chris? Chris, uh, what do you think about Jill Stein and Sherry Honkla taking food to the front lines of the KXL Popeye and uh, working with the homeless in Philadelphia and getting arrested? That's all part of the game. Yeah, I, I think, th th I think uh, 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 you know, you know Sherry, Sherry especially has a long history of this. I just saw her a couple weeks ago. And uh, I think, you know, she's essentially doing what I'm advocating. Uh, but I don't know that that is replicated throughout the party itself. Um, but yes, I think all of those acts are extremely important and acts that, and, 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 and again, I want to stress that I think we have, you know, having spent as long as I have months of my life in places like Gaza, when I was in seminary, I lived for two and a half years in a housing project in Boston and Roxbury, um, you learn when you walk into these places, especially as a reporter, that so many assumptions that you carry, however well-meaning those assumptions are, are wrong. And I think that we constantly need that kind of corrective, it, which we're only going to get with that kind of intimate relationship uh, if we are going to build a successful movement. Uh, and that corrective is almost daily. 
It's a corrective that one has to constantly hear. Um, changes that const often incremental changes at the moment that become seismic later. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the, the, the corporate state has done a very good job of creating this vast distance between the left in this country and the oppressed. And part of it was, of course, channeling energy on the part of the left into boutique activism, which has infected every college campus in this country. Multiculturalism, gender studies, you know, all of which I support, but not when it is divorced from justice. And so it was everything but justice, while the working class in this country was raped, and we did nothing but busy ourselves with gender politics, which is just what they wanted us to do. And we have to reclaim that justice, the fundamental justice, the right of the poor and working men and this women to have a decent standard of living. And we can't be egalitarian or, or uh, you know, snobs about it. We can't look down on microloan programs. We can't look down even on food banks. I mean, all of the things that I think the left traditionally says is just propping up the system. Because the suffering, having spent the last two years in the poorest parts of this country, is, is very severe. I mean, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, the average life expectancy for a male is 48. That is the lowest in the Western Hemisphere outside of Haiti. At any one time on Pine Ridge, 60% of the dwellings have neither electricity or running water. That's the United States. And of course, courtesy of Viacom, General Electric, Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, Disney, Clear Channel, these people have been rendered utterly invisible, except when we make fun of them. Whether that's on, I don't own a TV, so everything reference I make is dated. Whether that's, what's that shore, Jersey Shore, or um, um, you know, Jerry Springer, I don't even know if he's still on the air, but it's all about the only time we see the underclass is when we laugh at them. All right, good luck. Thanks very much.